I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. A super soaker in September, wet weather helping San Diego cool off after the heat wave. What the late season storm may mean for the region. I'm Peggy Pico. How prison realignment and the FBI's new definition of rape impact local crime rates and reporting. Then, recreating the 1965 Selma March, the NAACP's Journey for Justice March and Rally comes to San Diego tomorrow. What it means for jobs, voters, education, and racial profiling. We're not monks or anything like that. Being Buddhist doesn't necessarily mean that you can't drink. It's not the scene you expect at Frat Row, the two lifestyles San Diego State students are trying to balance inside the Greek system. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Our top story tonight, the Board of Supervisors just signed off on a settlement brought by three former staffers of Supervisor Dave Roberts. Supervisors agreed to pay a total of $310,000 to settle claims. The former employees accused Roberts of misusing his powers. Board members say they didn't necessarily believe all the allegations against Roberts. However, they found substantial risk. The bottom line, they say, jurors may find some of the contentions valid at trial. Robert says in a statement he strongly disagrees with the board's decision. Moisture from what was left of former tropical storm Linda dumped light to strong showers today in the mountains, valleys, and coastal areas. Rain watered lawns in El Cajon. This video is taken off Fletcher Parkway. The rain caught some students and staff off guard at San Diego State. Some left their umbrellas behind when it started pouring on campus. Looking at a broader picture of the rainstorm, National Weather Service says lingering moisture associated with what was Hurricane Linda brought us the rain, along with some short-term benefits, including a reprieve for fire-prone areas. Experts say it's an unusual event in a non-rainy season. It's pretty unusual to get rain in September out there. Um, for Lindbergh Field, we only see on average uh, about 0.13 inches of rain in the whole month of September, so we're expecting to maybe quadruple that at least today, maybe get, yeah, something like that, maybe around half inch down at Lindbergh Field. He says the storm will have little impact on the dry conditions in the region. San Diego drivers know the drill. Today's storm left behind slick roadways and flooded highways. Here's a look at the uh, rain driving north on the 5 today. We did see backups on other freeways where drivers sped up and spun out. And this is a look at mud taking over the 15. Caltrans tweeted the photo. This is in the uh, southbound lanes over Camino del Rio South. Showers have been on and off throughout the county today. We are expecting temperatures uh, mostly in the 80s and 70s over the next few days along the coast. More of the same for the uh, inland valley areas with 70s and 80s. In the mountains, look uh, for mostly 70s and 90s, back down into the 90s for the desert. San Diego does it again with water savings. We used 24% less water last month compared to the same period last year, cutting our water use uh, three months in a row, meeting the state conservation targets, mainly through landscape irrigation reductions. Water Authority says September's extreme heat presents a challenge, but rain this week should help maintain the trend. Helping folks transition after leaving the county jails, many do not uh, have valid forms of ID when they get out. KPBS reporter Megan Burke says now the county is teaming up with the Department of Motor Vehicles to change that. The county is rolling out a program that will let people who are nearing release from jail apply for state-issued ID cards. Christine Brown manages re-entry services for the sheriff and says not having an ID can keep former offenders from finding a job and a place to live. Many times people are very motivated to reintegrate into the community in a positive way, but even just something as simple as not having an ID can psychologically impact what is going to happen when you get released. Offenders who want IDs would pay for them out of their own pockets, and they must already be on file with the DMV. Megan Burks, KPBS News. 
An alleged groper caught on campus. Police at San Diego State arrested a 21-year-old man last night accused of grabbing female students. The first incident happened uh, inside a classroom in the Life Science Building. Officers say they responded to another report of a similar attack late last night. Two victims ID'd the suspect leading to the arrest. This marks the third report of sexual battery on campus in less than a week. The men's basketball program at San Diego State is under investigation tonight for possible recruiting violations. CBS Sports says the violations include improper benefits to recruits. It says the NCAA is looking into the claims. Coach Steve Fisher has turned the Aztecs into a perennial top 25 team, reaching the Sweet 16 National Tournament twice in the past five seasons. SDSU says they take the claims seriously and will cooperate with the NCAA. County supervisors are calling on the federal government to remove more than 1,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel from the San Onofre Nuclear Power Station up north. It closed down after a radiation leak was discovered in 2012, but the spent fuel will remain on site indefinitely. Congress has been unable to reach agreement on a permanent storage site. Supervisors Diane Jacob and Ron Roberts proposed the action, saying it's unacceptable to store radioactive fuel along the coast where it's prone to earthquakes and surrounded by millions of residents. San Diegans and community leaders will rally and march for equality downtown tomorrow. Peggy Pico explains how they plan to accomplish their goal. Tomorrow's march is the last leg of the NAACP 860-mile America's Journey for Justice campaign. The national event recreates the Selma to D.C. march of 1965. Organizers say they want equality through better access to higher education, stronger voting rights, and the end to racial profiling. Joining me are San Diego's NAACP president, Andre Branch, and attorney and local member, Todd Cardiff, who helped organize the event. And Andre, San Diego's rally and march is actually part of the NAACP's agenda for equal rights. What's the local message? The, the local message is that we want uh, civil rights uh, for all people. Uh, we want uh, uh, an expansion of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we want the platform is our jobs, our votes, our schools, uh, all matter. And specifically, uh, what does the NAACP want this to accomplish among Washington lawmakers? Well, we want an expansion of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we'd like to see an improvement in education. Uh, we want to see that uh, the minimum wage is raised to a, a wage that is livable for all people. And, uh, you know, we're looking at a map that was tracking the, the actual Selma march. Why is that important to recreate that and have that actual walk go on? Well, we are in the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act. And so we wanted to take that march from Selma, Alabama to uh, the nation's capital to recreate that and to get the attention of lawmakers across the nation uh, for this platform. Uh, we want to be certain that our lives matter to all the law enforcement officials that we encounter. Here and in D.C. Now, Todd, you recently joined the NAACP and helped organize tomorrow's uh, rally in downtown. Why did you get involved? Well, I became involved after I watched the arrest of Sandra Bland in Texas by a Texas police officer. And the, the way the arrest happened was such a clear violation of her civil rights and the Constitution um, that it infuriated me. And for those of you who don't know, Sandra Bland was a Black Lives activist who was arrested in Texas um, for essentially refusing to put out her, her cigarette, and she died in custody three days later. That infuriated me, but it also made me realize that, that when my civil rights are violated, I become angered and infuriated, whereas people of color ha have every reason to be terrified in their interactions with police officers. Because? Well, I think that there's not a standardized use of force, and, and people of color die at the hands of police officers at a, at a vastly uh, disproportionate rate compared to white people. Now, um, you're an attorney here in San Diego. What do you think is important here as far as having equal treatment for people of color? 
Well, first of all, um, I think that's really important to have transparency. And, and we need to have the body camera footage in the city of San Diego and the county of San Diego released to the public. One of the reasons that that's important is that we don't really know how the people uh, or the citizens of S San Diego, and especially people of color, are treated by police officers without that camera footage. And in fact, right now, um, the KPBS and other news organizations have, have sued to try to get, um, or involved in a lawsuit, to try to get the footage of the shooting of Farood Nahad, who was shot by mm -hmm. a San Diego police officer, and and Chief Zimmerman refuses to, to release that video. I see. And, um so do either one of you know, and I'll start with you, Andre, why no one from local law enforcement is participating in the march or the rally tomorrow? We invited uh, Chief Zimmerman uh, to participate, and we have received no response uh, from her. Mm -hmm. Any ideas from you, Todd? Uh, I don't. Maybe they don't support our goals. Okay. Um, we'll have to end on this. The Journey for Justice March uh, and rally begins tomorrow at 430 in downtown. That's right. uh, how many people are expected? We hope between two and 500, uh, those numbers could swell to 1,000 or more. All right, well, we've got a lot more information about America's Journey for Justice, March and Rally at kpbs.org. Dr. Andre Branch and Todd Cardiff, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for having thanks. us. Wildfires still racing out of control in Northern California. The Valley Fire near Napa's wine country has burned 67,000 acres so far. It's at 15% containment. Governor Brown has authorized an additional $12 million in emergency funds to support firefighting operations that will fund additional firefighters through December and pay for more helicopters. In just about two months, the state has already spent more than half of its nearly $400 million annual firefighting budget. The city and county are reviving an effort to woo film production to San Diego through some, uh, though some movie advocates say we're already, uh, we've already lost too much time. KPBS reporter Steve Walsh explains. Aside from sandy beaches and warm weather, most people outside of Southern California would sum up San Diego in a few scenes, like the Kansas City barbecue from Top Gun, or the beaches at Coronado Island in Some Like It Hot, or the real shots of Balboa Park that made it into a mostly Hollywood version of San Diego in The Anchorman. Local film production has been steadily drying up for more than a decade. It may have hit bottom in 2013 when San Diego disbanded its film commission. This summer, the city and county have been working on a reboot. What we're talking about doing is setting up a film office that can help people that want to do filming here, whether they're TV commercials, whether they're TV shows, whether they're movies. We want to have easy access for people to do that here. In June, the city council set aside $100,000 to create a film office. In the meantime, the city and county have been gathering input from industry and the public on what the new group might look like. Robert says they hope to have a proposal after the first of the year. Sandy Buhner with the San Diego Film Commission Foundation says that's too slow for a community with such a rich filming tradition. Starting this year, California tripled its film credit to lure back uh, production to the Golden State. She says San Diego is already at a disadvantage in the early rounds. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Hewlett Packard is slashing as many as 30,000 jobs. The company is spinning off its technology division that focuses on software, consulting, and data analysis. The Silicon Valley pioneer hopes the move will save $2 billion annually. HP has laid off tens of thousands of employees in recent years to help boost declining profits caused by the shift from PCs to smartphones. Help Wanted, a San Diego company looking to take advantage of Qualcomm's impending layoffs, rolling out the welcome mat for IT engineers and application developers. Holding a series of job fair luncheons at its facility in Sereno Valley, American Specialty Health, or ASH, has clients in all 50 states. It's a growing health benefits company that started with chiropractic and acupuncture providers. They also provide fitness benefits for people on Medicare. Our neighbors down the street here at Qualcomm are having a layoff, so we did time these luncheons to coincide with those announcements. So we would like to tell all our 
friends at Qualcomm, if they're looking for work to come by to ASH, uh, apply for one of our open technology jobs and uh, come to work for a company that's been here for a long time. American Specialty Health was founded in San Diego 28 years ago. The company is looking to hire about 30 IT professionals this year. By the way, Qualcomm plans to lay off about 4,700 workers in San Diego. It's been hurt by slower growth in the smartphone business. The medical marijuana industry may see new regulations with a package of three bills on Governor Brown's desk right now. They would be the first regulations after voters legalized medical marijuana nearly 20 years ago. If signed, all medical marijuana products would be required to undergo testing for pesticides, mold, and for the amounts of cannabinoids, marijuana's active chemicals, dispensary owners are concerned. My biggest concern is that it's going to drive a black market, that California has worked from Proposition 215 up to bring this into a white, clear, transparent industry. And by allowing um, the way they, the legislation falls, I'm afraid that they're going to criminalize patients, again, for growing their own medicine. Governor Brown has less than two weeks to either sign or veto the bills. Tonight, we take a closer look at a crime report we first told you about last night. Peggy Pico finds out what's behind the decrease in some crimes here and the slight uptick in others. Property crimes and violent crimes throughout the county are down, while homicide and a few other crimes rose slightly, says a mid-year report of local law enforcement agencies by SANDAG, the San Diego Association of Governments. Joining me with the impact of prison realignment on local crime rates are my guests, Escondido Police Chief Craig Carter and Cynthia Burke, Director of Criminal Justice Research at SANDAG. And Cynthia, um, before we get started here, when prison realignment went into effect four years ago, critics predicted crime rates would soar. A lot of people did anyway. But arrest records show that that really actually didn't happen. Overall, in the county, violent crimes, burglary and motor vehicle theft were down. But the number of homicides, robbery and larceny went up slightly. So, Cynthia, why was there an increase in those last three crimes? Um, well, I think for homicide, it's important to consider the small numbers. We had four more homicides, so yes, there was an increase. We went from 39 for the first half of 2014 to 43 for the first half of 2015. And when you consider the size of our population, our proximity to the border, places, um, L.A. had about 100, over 150, Chicago had 300 during the same six-month period. So even though there's four more, it's still too many. We don't want any homicides, but it's still a small increase. Robbery was a 1% increase. We saw it, uh, seven more robberies for the first half of the year than the second half. The bigger, biggest driver is property crime. Most crime that's reported to law enforcement is property crime, and we saw larcenies go up 4%. There was about 30 more per week across the San Diego region. Do you know why? Um, you know, I, I, if I knew why, I could help we law could enforcement help not have um, any right. property crime at all. Um, people have speculated, is it due to Prop 47 or changes in the law? Um, I've been surprised that we haven't seen crime go up sooner because it kept going down after so many consecutive decreases. Right, and that gets me to you, Chief Carter, because in the last uh, few years, Escondido has had similar results as we just yeah. saw here. But this year, larceny was also on the rise uh, in Escondido. Can you briefly explain what larceny is and, and what do you attribute the increase to? A definition of larceny is basically the unlawful taking of somebody else's property. Um, the difference between a larceny and a burglary is usually the in the vehicle burglary, it's a locked door as opposed to an open window. So that one would be a burglary, one would be a larceny. Uh, so you're looking at so taking somebody else's property. I think we're seeing a, a little bit of an increase based on a little bit more savvy criminals that are that, that know how far they can push it with the Proposition 47 uh, passing. So we are seeing a little bit of an increase based on that, but I'm not sure I can attribute it just to Prop 47. Well, well, speaking of uh, Prop 47, has prison realignment, have you seen it affect crime rates in Escondido? Uh, well, prison realignment for us, uh, we, you know, we, all the, the cities have a certain population of uh, AB 109 uh, people that have been released. So what we do is we just have to address that population just a little bit different. So it's increased our relationship with our probation officers. I actually have a, a handful of probation officers that are housed inside the Escondido Police Department that work strictly with us and working on that uh, AB 109 population. So Cynthia, um, another thing that has changed besides Prop 47 is recently the FBI, I understand, has changed the definition of rape. How has the definition changed and has that had any impact on crime rates? It did, and that's why we didn't focus on change in violent crime with this mid-year crime report. What the FBI did and what California City started changing how they um, defined it and categorized it rape in 2015 um, was expanding the victims. 
before this change, only females could be victims of rape. Now it's males or females. And there was a very strict definition of uh, penetration. And now that definition has also been expanded to um, include different body parts on both the victim and the offender is the most basic way. So we had 511 rapes reported in the first half of 2015. Um, we the crimes that we track in this report that's available online are part one crimes. There's a standardized definition. There's also part two crimes, which law enforcement agencies can report differently. So 88 crimes that would have been part two before that wouldn't have been in these stats are now in these rape stats and in these part one stats. And aggravated assaults are also now, some of those are also rapes. So we saw a 6% drop in aggravated assault. Some of that decrease may be that because change Because it shifted on over to the new definition of exactly. rape. Exactly. So Chief Carter, how do you use this kind of information, whether it's aggravated assault, larceny, or the new rape definition as a, as a police chief? Well, we, we follow the information very carefully. It, it certainly drives what we do. We will actually change what our behavior based on the information that we receive. And as an example, we saw an uptick in, in auto theft uh, last year. And what we did was we, uh, in Escondido, we realigned our detective division and added more detectives in that area and more training in patrol to try to combat the auto theft, which brought our numbers back down again. So we look at these and we react accordingly. And we talk with uh, the other chiefs in the county. This, this county has a great uh, job collaborating and, and solving problems because the criminals don't stay just in Escondido, they travel. Well, most So we want to get that out there as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the full report is on our website, kpbs.org. Escondido Police Chief Craig Carter and Sandag's Cynthia Burke, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour. We talk with the German ambassador to the U.S. about the global repercussions of Europe's ongoing migrant crisis. Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. It may be better than singing in the rain. Four year old Jackson was clearly thrilled about today's showers. His dad shared this video from Rolando on Instagram saying he didn't want to get off the trampoline. We should dry out over the next 24 hours. San Diego State University could be the first in the country with a Buddhist fraternity and sorority. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser says organizers are aiming to strike a balance between a monastery and animal house. When the Buddha attained enlightenment, he realized the four noble truths that explain the human condition. The first truth he taught is that all life is suffering. This rings true for San Diego State University sophomore Caitlin Leary. Every single part of college is suffering. You're stressed out all of the time. Next, the Buddha taught that to end suffering, you must end desire. Leary agrees. You have certain expectations for everything in your life. You want things, you want that boy to like you back, you want that new purse. But if you stop expecting so much out of everything, you're just so much happier. She's been exploring Buddhism since she took a class on it last semester and now is working with other students to open a Buddhist fraternity and sorority at SDSU. You might think there would be a major clash between fraternities and Buddhism, but Leary says there's a middle ground. We're not monks or anything like that. Like we're college students learning about the philosophies and the teachings of the Buddha. Being Buddhist doesn't necessarily mean that you can't drink. Being Buddhist doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have a social life. Jeff Zlotnick holds meditation classes near SDSU and came up with the Buddhist fraternity and sorority idea. Anyone's mind race all day long, just thinking and thinking and thinking, not going to stop your racing mind. Members don't have to be Buddhist, he says. They'll have regular meditation and house rules based on Buddhist teachings of compassion, but also normal Greek activities date dashes and formals and parties, but hopefully with some mindful behavior and mindful activities and mindful action. What would a mindful mixer look like? A mindful mixer look like, I'm not sure yet. Uh, come back to me in about two years and uh, we'll tell you that. A local fraternity is now at the center of a freedom of religion debate. Last spring, a Christian fraternity lost its recognition at another California state campus because it barred non-Christians from holding leadership roles. Zlotnick says he's expecting most of the fraternity and sorority members won't be Buddhist. And, and when you're done three, four, five years later, you still won't be Buddhist. You'll just be a little bit happier, a little more peaceful, a little more compassion, and hopefully spend more time taking care of others than you do yourself. Zlotnick is describing the Buddha's fourth noble truth. To end desire, you must follow the Eightfold Path.
That includes moral actions, thoughtful speech, and mindfulness, or being in the present moment. You don't have to react instantaneously to things when they might be stressful or irritating. You can take a moment and react with love and compassion. SDSU senior Matt Sheldon has been following this path for about a year. He joined a different fraternity when he started college, but it was quickly kicked off campus. He says a Buddhist fraternity would provide a support system of like-minded brothers. I still have fun. I still go out and do things, but there's plenty of times where it's an early night and you get up and you feel better the next day, you know? So I'm not your typical drink and hit up Trujillo's for tacos. Sheldon says he hopes through Delta Beta Tau, students can learn to better handle college. I see people freaking out in classes and you just don't have that rooted detachment that causes the stress and the anger and all the other issues that people wind up following a different path to kind of take care of them with, you know? Because you have that practice of meditation to center yourself. And prepare them for the next steps on their paths. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.